Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the EPALE discussion on building skills for democratic life, the role of adult learning and education. My name is Elisa Gambardella, and I am the pleasure to moderate this discussion on behalf of the LLLP, of which I am the vice president. As you may know, the lifelong learning platform LLLP is an umbrella organization that gathers 42 European civil society organizations active in the fields of education, training and youth coming from all over Europe and beyond and covering all sectors of formal, non-formal and informal learning. As you know, this is an introductory debate through which we aim at triggering further reflections and discussions among the online audience who has the opportunity to continue debating this important topic all day long on the website of EPALE, so don't miss the chance to do that. To help us identify key points in this discussion on the role of adult learning for building skills for democratic life, I'm very pleased to have along with me two experts with different perspectives on it. Giulia Meschino is the director of the European Vocational Training Association, EFTA, and Georg Pirker, president of Democracy and Human Rights Education in Europe, DARE Network. Before giving them the floor, let me briefly introduce this topic, sharing the view of the LLP and hopefully spurring some reflections already for our guests. Aligning to a fast-paced and ever-changing reality, as you know, the European Commission has officially announced that 2023 will be the European Year of Skills. This decision stems from the need to address the mismatch between employment needs and education sectors, but it reveals also a vision that positions education as the sporting partner of the labour market. However, transversal skills and key competencies, such as critical thinking, problem solving and digital literacy cut across sectors, fields, tasks and lives. When modernizing education and training systems, therefore, it is crucial to adopt a lifelong learning approach and introduce reforms holistically because this prevents exclusion and ensures a common and steady path towards sustainable learning societies. Indeed, a fundamental endeavor of education is to keep learners with the necessary transversal skills to navigate modern seas. So what we're going to do through this online conference is to discuss how skills, competencies and attitudes ultimately enable people to find fulfillment in their lives and adapt to fast paced changes beyond labor market participation. Skills, whether vocational or social, technical or key competencies, help adults cope with current crises and make them more conscious about their potential in society. And this, in turn, enhances democratic participation and strengthens both communities and social life. At times when the attention is more diverted towards the recovery from the pandemic, modernization and the twin transitions or the current energy crisis, Europe must not forget the existing threats to democ democratic values, which have been resurging across the continent. Today, we're here to discuss if adult learning and education could be the solution to these fundamental questions. And to do so, I would like to engage our guests already and starting from Julia, to whom I ask, how can vocational education and training be a champion of skills for democracy? And if you see the need for a paradigm shift in the approach to, be, to VET. Thank you very much, Elisa, and good morning to everyone also from my side. As Elisa mentioned, I represent uh, a European association uh, of VET providers, so our focus is uh, uh, deeply on vocational education and training in the initial uh, um, perspective, but also continuous and adult learning. What we believe is that vocational education and training can do play a significant role in fostering skills for democracy. Uh, vocational education and training uh, usually provides individuals with technical skills, but uh, in our perspective uh, uh, should also provide the necessary uh, skills to uh, become the city to, to make people becoming the citizens of the future. Um, the, um, these skills that are referred as transversal skills or soft skills um, should uh, be uh, included, embedded in the training provision. Uh, and as that providers association, we, uh, we think that this is uh, actually uh, one of the uh, <clears throat> aspect that can make uh, vocational training uh, provision uh, of a certain uh, quality. So it should, th this concept of providing uh, soft skills uh, in order to, uh, to succeed in life should be also uh, embedded in the current concept of vocational excellence that has been uh, uh, developed in the last years 
by the European institutions. Um, uh, that uh, usually is seen as uh, uh, providing people with uh, um, uh, skills that can uh, allow them to become successful and productive members of the economies. Uh, democratic values and principles such as freedom of expression, participation, equal opportunity, solidarity, these are skills that should be directly or indirectly integrated in the in curricula and that parts. Actually, yesterday I was uh, exchanging some words with a representative of the European Economic and Social Committee, uh, and we were uh, talking about uh, the uh, this uh, issue increasing participation in democratic life uh, and how that can uh, uh, support this and the interested the interesting feedback that i got from uh, <clears throat> from this representative is that uh, usually uh, um, skills like uh, uh, civic participation uh, uh, democratic uh, uh, skills these are more taught in uh, uh, context in university context it's more a prerogative of higher education uh, in that curricula uh, we focus much more on technical skills this itself creates a sort of a discrimination which we should um, we should not uh, promote as such we, we should may we should organize our uh, uh, training delivery in a way that uh, people undergoing uh, vocational training are also equipped with those skills that can improve their uh, life uh, conditions, uh, but also can improve their social uh, conditions. Um, I want to uh, stress the importance of some kind of skills uh, uh, like, for example, critical thinking, problem solving, uh, teamwork skills. These are essential for a thriving democracy beyond professional development. Uh, and in order to um, um, in order to um, to give you some practical examples, because uh, I think that sometimes words are just uh, words, and uh, providing practical examples can really. Uh, make the difference. I would like to uh, to mention one of uh, the initiatives that uh, EFTA has been involved in. Uh, it's actually a project funded by the Erasmus Plus program, and it's called NetVet. Uh, you will be provided with a link to this uh, uh, to this project. The importance of uh, uh, the NetVet project is that. Uh, it came from the from a, um, a need of the uh, vet providers uh, that uh, could actually um, uh, identify uh, the lack of uh, um, critical thinking uh, uh, approaches, especially in uh, 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 vet schools dealing with young people. Uh, where uh, a lot of students are coming, especially from uh, disadvantaged socio socioeconomic contexts, uh, and they uh, might have failed uh, uh, of previous educational pathways. So uh, in this context, uh, the importance of uh, um, teaching how to uh, deal with uh, uh, social media, uh, especially with, with all the flow of information that we we can um, uh, find on uh, on the internet and uh, the use of social media, how to deal with that, how to uh, recognize uh, if um, news that we are receiving are real, based on real facts, or they might be fake news. We need to uh, provide our uh, uh, students with uh, a certain uh, uh, level of critical thinking. But to do so, we need to uh, also to teach our uh, tra teachers and trainers how to transfer this kind of uh, uh, critical thinking and problem solving skills. Uh, so for with the NetDebt project, uh, we uh, developed a series of tools uh, in order to uh, support uh, that, uh, our teachers and trainers in transferring these skills. And I want to just to show you very briefly, this is a, our uh, educational toolkit guide that you can uh, find also uh, online on the uh, NetBet website. Uh, and it's one of the output of, uh, of the project. Um, so uh, this is more or less my, my answer to your question, Elisa, but I would be happy to, to, to go further into it if, uh, if there is any uh, curiosity that, uh, that you want to explore. 
Thank you very much, Julia. And I believe that uh, the audience who, that is following this debate can find um, the link to the toolkit that you just showed on the website and they can, of course, uh, use it for uh, further in this discussion online. In the meantime, we have also received a couple of comments uh, online that I would like to share with you and uh, ask you both to comment if you like, because I believe they're quite um, aligned with what you were saying also, Julia. So from Erodeia, we have uh, the following comment that is, it is important to develop not only skills needed at work, but basic skills in general, which contribute to personal growth, self-esteem and the opportunity to integrate in society or let's say foster social inclusion. And then um, we have another one from Olena, which I would like to mention um, <coughs> from Ukraine. So also with a um, very particular um, perspective on this, I would say that is that in transition in democracies, an active uh, civil society plays a very important role, helping to create or build strong and independent democratic institutions. And as we know very well, of course, from the life and learning platform perspectives, but also from your perspectives, um, civil society organizations are indeed essential providers for the transversal competencies and skills that we're discussing. So uh, that's why I found them to be quite complementary and why I would like you to, uh, I would like to ask you to comment on these comments if you like. Yeah, well, um, I totally agree with both comments, actually. Uh, as I said uh, before, uh, we tend to give to vocational training uh, the role of equipping people with very technical skills, very sectorial skills. But when we do so, we forget that uh, we are not uh, equipping machines, we are equipping individuals, and these individuals are part of a society. Uh, so we need to make sure that they can of course, uh, have those skills that are required for uh, uh, the labor market, but it's not just because they have to be integrated in the labor market. So through the integration in the labor market comes also the integration into the society. But, and if we do not equip those people uh, with skills that are also needed in order for them to live in a society that is multicultural, that is composed of uh, different uh, people with different kind of uh, uh, features, we risk uh, to uh, create individuals that are not capable to interact uh, with each other, are not capable to, uh, to have uh, their own uh, opinions. And this uh, ca can be a trend that um, uh, take people away from the participation in the democratic life of the society. So I stress again the importance of uh, uh, taking into consideration uh, transversal skills and soft skills into the uh, training provision, which is not uh, actually um, taken for granted because uh, as, as I know, not all vet providers are uh, giving that much importance to, to those uh, kind of competencies. Thank you, Julia. It is indeed uh, important to acknowledge also uh, areas for improvement in this sense and develop toolkits that can help um, developing these concepts. Uh, Georg, I'm aware that uh, Data Network has developed a position paper on how skills could be seen through a perspective that highlights, as we were saying, the contribution to fostering critical thinking, problem solving, etc., and ultimately more conscious participation in society. Would you like to tell us about that? Yes, I can link up a bit to that. Well, I'm Georg Pirker. Thank you very much for inviting me to this nice online session here. And I'm president of the DARA network. So what I can say is uh, basically, um, I see not such a big contradiction between, let's say, the VET orientation and the human rights and democracy orientation, because we have to have a look on, uh, let's say, on the globe of all these uh, uh, issues, how they play together. And uh, let's say also VET is a, a field where we have kind of specifically in Europe, kind of a long history of civil organizing, like through trade unions to further education and training to co-management, taking co-decisions also on the workplace and in the in the field of employment and work. So uh, I do not think that they that one has to handle them so strict and so separated when we talk about democratic transitions and economic transitions, but we have to think about, let's say, the region in the world where it takes place actually and where it happens yeah, and where, let's say, where the competing models are. And uh, so basically, for me, the main question is how, uh, we support people that have to deal with increasingly complex 
big social, economical, and subsequent political societal changes, and uh, how we can support people uh, to act in this, uh, let's say, in these realities from a position of being subjects of change, of being confident, of being self-effective, and of gaining, uh, let's say, uh, experiences that, uh, let's say, confirm or help them explore a way uh, of, let's say, the, of meaningful democratic participation and interaction, not only in society, but in the world of work, in the world of business, in all of these things where these things apply. Yeah. So, and uh, for, for me, this is one, one of the very important uh, takeaways when we talk about, let's say, highlighting right now the year of skills, uh, skills is an interplay when we talk about competences they interplay with values with rights and with knowledge and there's different dimensions uh, connected to it so it's not only about equipping people like let's say to to build up the new workforce for the coming century or for the coming decades but also to see how people can act confidently and uh, uh, gain let's say uh, gain, gain these experiences from work, gain them from society and from their personality, kind of, uh, and gain this trust of being self effective and being, let's say, being able to cope with these changes on the big societal, as the same as uh, on the individual level of people, I would say. Yeah. Um, so for me, it's very helpful uh, to, to understand that when we talk about upskilling or when we talk about kind of the the, the, the skills needed uh, to master the economic transition or to master let's say the, the related transitions with digitalization with sustainability with climate change all these things uh, that we are also talking about uh, that we are actually working in a topic which is also predefined by the European pillar of social rights yeah uh, even if it's very whack and it's not kind of really kind of binding at least kind of it gives kind of an idea where things can go and where things uh, where, where things uh, apply uh, to certain rights or adhere to certain spheres of rights and this is a this is topics uh, which I think cannot be seen isolated but th that fit together and that have an interplay and from an educational perspective from the vet field or from the human rights education and democracy learning field uh, I, I would say it's about fostering uh, uh, these these connections and uh, these dimensions of that we are actually talking about uh, about uh, uh, legal instruments that we are talking about kind of rights of people of social groups uh, that are confirmed or uh, challenged uh, by these transitions. Yeah. Um, when we talk about um, uh, the, the, this 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 topic of uh, how people can let's say can can equip themselves or can be supported through educational context, for me very helpful is to think about these frames of the OECD transformative competences, where, where it's about creating new value, which means, of course, people have to uh, to find innovation uh, or we will have to find innovation uh, and innovative solutions uh, being the core of inclusive and sustainable development uh, on the other hand uh, we see kind of that uh, people have to uh, are people but not only people social groups uh, we, we in europe we have to reconcile tensions and dilemmas uh, potentially uh, competing potentially being contradictory or also potentially uh, facing incompatible goals. So go will we go only, let's say, for mastering digital transformation, like from a perspective of that we have to compete worldwide on AE mastering, or, or do we have uh, are there, are there other topics which have to balance uh, our, our approaches to it? Yeah. And all this also comes Again, like uh, in line with this third uh, transformative competence is defined by the OECD, which is like taking a responsibility for it individually, but also socially, yeah, and considering the effects of our actions and uh, the, the, the eventual outcomes of possible actions, which for me are deeply democratic questions, are deeply social questions, but also are deeply value and rights based questions. And I think uh, in one of the comments, uh, uh, I think it was Olena who mentioned like this transitioning democracies uh, where an active civil society plays a very important role. I think this is exactly uh, this topic where we have to uh, to think 
uh, of and where we have to be aware of that kind of, uh, we have to understand the European model of uh, how, how democracy is organized in the different member states of Europe and even within the European Union is also in a transitioning phase. Yeah, uh, it's not an end model, but it's uh, it's a model which has to answer or has to find new answers to upcoming challenges that are posed by these, let's say, uh, big, big social, economical, and, uh, and uh, subsequent political societal transformations. Yeah, and uh, potentially uh, uh, the the big difficulty is that we see it goes beyond. Uh, it, it goes far beyond the, let's say, uh, the, the, the capacity also of our politicians yeah, <laughs> uh, to deal with uh, with with uh, with with, uh, with these uh, transformations from a perspective of being capable to master it. But there's also a bit of diving into a fog, um, uh, in a fog of where a lot of things become un unconscious and where people need to to adjust a compass. Uh, uh, Which is indeed why uh, I would say, if I may, uh, we need lifelong learning and adult learning, right? So to help definitely. this transition and to make sure that it's a continuous uh, progress in yeah, the democratic definitely. foundations of our societies. Um, thank you very much, Georg. Julia, would you like to comment on that? Or to add no, I, I just want to... Questions? Sorry, sorry, Lisa. I just want to say that I totally agree with Georg uh, and that uh, we have all the frameworks that we can use in order to foster these transverse transformation skills. Uh, let's think about the life comp. It's there. It mentions a list of uh, 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 competencies that are required uh, to uh, improve people's life. Let's find a way uh, to uh, embed this competency in the vocational training provision. I'm talking about that perspective because it's the perspective that I represent. And I understand that the, different, the differences in the systems uh, in Europe might also be an obstacle in order to ensure uh, um, an harmonization of uh, uh, this provision in all European countries. But let's uh, try to do our best in order to uh, foster member states to uh, make it uh, as a uh, as a part of the uh, education system, but m m in particular of the vocational uh, uh, education system. Because uh, so far, very few providers are uh, taking this into account. And again, I go back to the practice that I was talking before. It was really coming from a need that was uh, uh, assessed in the bad schools that uh, uh, participated in uh, in the partnership of the project. So th they already see the need for this uh, um, provision. Let's find a way to, to make it uh, a systematic uh, uh, part of, uh, uh, of uh, the training offer. And also, like you said, Julia, let's uh, keep advocating and find a way to ensure policy coherence also across the legislative and policy frameworks at the European level. Uh, Georg mentioned, for instance, the European pillar of social rights as an important reference. Another one that we mentioned before is, of course, this opportunity that is offered by the European Year of Skills to further this advocacy and um, vision for transversal skills as the key and basic ones to be fostered and developed um, along with labour market related ones, but not after them. So uh, I would like to ask you, Julia, along with, with what you also just said, uh, how do you think that we could mainstream this understanding of transversal competencies during the European era of skills? And how do you think that we as education um, providers can engage with that? And I there, of course, should... if you want to come in afterwards, you're welcome to do that. I think we should act all together. I mean, we are all part of the lifelong learning platform, which is the, the most important uh, platform for advocating uh, in the field of education, training, uh, youth. Let's uh, use the platform. Let's use. Uh, let, let's put all of us together and let's try to, to mainstream as much as possible uh, these needs that are coming maybe from different kind of uh, stakeholders because we uh, represent different kind of stakeholders. But uh, it's actually for a, a common goal that is the one of increasing the participation of democratic life uh, of our uh, citizens. So I think that uh, uh, we are in the best position acting together in order to uh, foster, to push uh, 
this uh, uh, participation. And another thing that I want to stress is that usually the events that are organized in this framework uh, of um, the European year or, for example, the uh, European Bad Skills Week, they tend to address uh, organizations that are already uh, aware of these needs, that are already working uh, in, this, uh, in this sense, organizations, individuals. Let's try to go a little bit uh, uh, farther than that and let's try to identify those that are not yet uh, on the same page with the others, those that are not yet aware of uh, uh, these needs. And let's try to talk to them, let's try to engage them, because otherwise we are always going to refer to uh, the usual suspects uh, that are, I mean, have the same opinions uh, as us, have uh, already the same perspectives. Let, let's address those that aren't, that don't have these, these opinions, these perspectives, and let's try to engage in a debate with them. Because I think that we need to, um, to, to uh, get in contact with uh, uh, those that are a little bit far from our uh, um, our common ground, and I, and this would be uh, needed. And I think that uh, uh, the, the European Year of Skills could also uh, play this role, approaching uh, um, those individuals and organizations that are uh, uh, a little bit far from the the, the engagement, the, so, the civil society engagement. Thank you very much. Georg, would you like to add on that? Uh, what I would add is, um, it is, uh, of course, it's super important to uh, to be aware from our organizational perspective that we are also kind of, we have to think outside of our boxes. Yeah? <laughs> we have to reach out of our, uh, outside our boxes. On the other hand, uh, I think uh, the, the main idea is kind of really to, uh, fr from this uh, civil society uh, and uh, let's say organization perspective is also that uh, kind of, uh, it is simply super important to question from a power critical perspective on these topics. It is super important to think about what does inclusion mean when we talk about inclusive growth and we talk about skills for inclusion. Yeah, is everyone represented as Julia Meschino mentioned, is, is everyone kind of um, uh, having, having their cards in the game who is, not represented, whose voices are not heard when, uh, let's say, uh, these transitions are being tackled. Yeah, uh, when 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 there is kind of uh, the layout uh, being developed, like uh, for policies that foster digital transition or that foster sustainable growth in Europe, is it is it lip services uh, or is it kind of also uh, uh, let's say reacting or taking up uh, the needs of those that are not really represented in it? And sometimes I think uh, the 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 European frames they offer nice ways to handle these uh, to the, the, these issues because they are kind of uh, taking up very much these individual needs of groups or of, of people that are not so much in the debate. On the other hand, I would say um, uh, the, the big uh, yeah, the big topic to master is also to say how to advocate for that from an educational perspective that includes all these different fields from youth up to uh, higher education uh, and that um, and, and here the lifelong learning platform indeed is i think the the right organization also uh, uh, to raise that voice i would say Thanks, Georg. Uh, both you and Julia mentioned the importance of having a diverse representation of stakeholders, if we can put it like that, in these yeah. discussions, including the European Year of Skills. And um, it just, um, it, I would like to refer to a comment that we received online that I think is related to this um, from Linda, who says, uh, we know that social skills are an essential part of life and also work, but employers invest in professional knowledge because social skills can transfer from one company to another. So the question is, should employers be involved in improving the social skills of their employees? And I ask no. it to both of you. Yeah. Can just jump in. Definitely, yes. On the other hand, I would say uh, social skills are not only basic skills, but probably it's also the super skills to have. Yeah. <laughs> um, uh, uh, otherwise, I guess you have to be short in the online comment, but surely we can elaborate further. 
um, uh, de definitely, I, I think it is uh, it is a super important topic. And if one looks at all these different competencies frames developed, if it's DIC comp, if it's entre comp, if it's life comp, if it's kind of the transformative competencies or the Council of Europe reference frameworks on competencies for democratic culture, they they all highlight especially these skills because they offer the interplay of the different active uh, of the different dimensions and and it's not so much the technical ones but it's the ones that uh, where people kind of uh, uh, have more or less the foundations for their personal growth for their self-efficacy for their uh, for for yeah, gaining trust in their capacities or uh, for 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 taking action and taking responsibility and critical responsibility, I would say, and uh, this is of course definitely important. Uh, but I would say it's not only employers who have to offer that to their employees, but it's simply in a democracy uh, these uh, skills are essential for participation and for meaningful uh, interaction of citizens. So one probably should ask a bit away from. Uh, is it only the, the 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 skills that are the entry entry card uh, for for the for being engaged in the democratic life of European Union, or is it being the citizens, being the humans living in Europe as the entry card, and then ask only at the second dimension? Okay, but what does that mean about skills, and what does that mean about let's say communication of skills gaps and shortcomings and all these things that are kind of communicated from a level of political economical analysis? in spite of uh, having a demographic situation where in a few years we will not talk about skills mismatches but simply on a big workforce mismatch because we have all done because i do want to ask you about the digital uh, transition and the competencies yeah. we'll bring about but first i would like to hear from julia i saw you were nodding while georg was speaking uh, would you like to um, complement what he said well uh, i think georg expressed the uh, the position which which i totally share uh, quite uh, quite right i mean uh, i th i see uh, social uh, competencies as a, a a duty of the society it's not only the employers as georg already said but it's really every part of uh, our civil societies they uh, have to engage in uh, uh, making sure that these social skills are uh, uh, developed and this is beneficial to 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 everyone uh, employers I, I can understand the perspective of employers though i don't share it at all uh, they are uh, uh, probably um, focusing more on the productive uh, uh, side of uh, their workers and that's why they invest much more in upskilling reskilling especially in this very uh, fast speed evolution society we live with technology changing uh, uh, every day uh, but uh, those that are investing in uh, uh, social uh, uh, aspects, uh, social interrelations uh, uh, among their uh, uh, workers, they are those that are actually um, taking the most of it, also in terms of productivity. And mm -hmm. I'm, I'm thinking about some examples we have uh, in Italy uh, of uh, uh, very uh, important uh, uh, um, employers that have decided to uh, create uh, environments for their workers that are also based on social values uh, they are also sharing uh, uh, the, the benefits the profits of their companies with their employers uh, i heard uh, some of them i'm pretty sure that there, there are examples like that in all european countries we should take those examples into account and try to uh, to, to diffuse them as much as possible because I think that this is the the, the key also to uh, get employers more engaged in this um, in this context and uh, uh, making them an active uh, players also in this uh, um, uh, improving of social competencies. Thank you very much, Julia. And like I mentioned, Georg, I do want to ask you about the, the digital transition because I know that Dari Network has worked extensively on the topics and concepts of digital citizenship and digital participation. So I would like to ask you to share with our audience um, how, in, if and how, from your point of view, the digital transition and the skills and competencies it brings about, of course, can be a hub for democracy. Um, 
Yeah, it's a big question whether they can be the hub for democracy or a hub <laughs> for democracy. I would say definitely they are, uh, since digital transition happens anyway. Yeah, all our lives are already kind of shaped post-digitally, co-shaped by digital environments, socially, uh, politically, but also in in the dimension of work and uh, employment. Of course, yeah, because everyone from us is connected. Uh, is uh, uh, working on offline uh, has, let's say, different enhancements uh, in the body sphere from having like trackers uh, using whatever. Yeah, so there's, a, I think there's a lot of things related to it. Um, what our, let's say, core question actually are uh, that we are trying to ask from, from the DARA perspective um, uh, is, uh, what kind of digital transformation competences do citizens need to understand the, the digital transformation in their society and how it affects them in their different social roles? So did we, we understand digital transformation as a, as, a, as a social phenomenon very much. Yeah. And the second big question is how fundamental rights and ethical foundations uh, are related to these transformations. Where do they shift their nature? What weakens them and what kind of development strengthens their enforcement? Yeah, uh, We have seen a lot of uh, European initiatives with a GDPR, which affects more, let's say, the individual sphere, uh, but also with the Digital Services Act and with the with with the with the bigger regulations uh, that uh, show us that kind of the European Union plays a quite important role on on that topic uh, because it cannot be regulated on the national sphere because the Pandora is uh, the boxes are no the it's all out of Pandora's box, <laughs> so to say, yeah. And uh, but we we have to understand it as a as a the, the transformation as a also as a chance, which has kind of negative and positive technical opportunities. And it's up to us as citizens to decide where we want to steer it. And it's quite important uh, to make people aware that this is another sphere simply where also they have to take conscious decisions since uh, these decisions affect uh, their democratic life, uh, they affect their social life, and they affect the, them individually in form of being a person that has uh, then barriers or opportunities also for personal growth via digitalization. And I think this makes it very short. Yeah, uh, And uh, such we argue very much for a, a rights dimension, uh, understanding digital transformation, but understanding digital transformation really in all these different spheres as a something where we as educators have to work for because we have to support people in gaining, let's say, capacities or uh, developing capacities or exploring their capacities in, in this field. On the other hand, we have to use the digital means as the transformation instruments. Yeah, uh, it's nothing you can do only in theory, but you have to understand practically what it means if you choose that platform or that platform, this instrument or that instrument yeah and by uh, really kind of bringing it down to uh, to 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 that very basic and fundamental decisions uh, where I'm pro where I'm against where do I offer let's say my privacy what do I gain from it or not yeah uh, people uh, can can actually take very very conscious and very uh, very confident decisions yeah so it's not such a big dragon that just sails around and no one knows how to how to time it but on the other hand uh, it's uh, it, it deals a lot with responsibility you can take individually but also where we need regulation because it uh, is for the, for the individual it's kind of also uh, I would say sometimes a bit too much. So it's good that there are rules, and these rules, uh, and within these rules, uh, there is also kind of I think uh, uh, good ways also for economical development, and uh, that, that kind of uh, provide also a democratic or European way of how to mass master digitalization. I would say. Thank you very much, Georg, um, for this intervention as well as the previous ones. Thanks a lot to Julia as well for her contribution uh, to this important discussion. Thanks to Epale for offering a platform to do that. And thanks to the audience who has been following us so far and who I um, warmly invite to continue engaging in the online discussion, continuing until 4 p.m. today on the website of Epale. To do so, let me also share a final comment uh, from the online sphere which is a bit provocative, but maybe good indeed for sparring a bit of a, of a discussion online as well. And the comment is the following, you see it there. Don't we need to speak more about responsibilities in the democratic society, developing of responsible citizens of Europe? We need to develop balance of rights and responsibilities. 
So I would like to thank Ilse as well as all the others who commented so far and really invite you all to continue discussing this fundamental topic online. Thank you very much and have a nice continuation of your day. Thank you. Thank you very much.